Hi, and welcome to my podcast, Jack to the Future. From science and inventions to pollution and recycling, I talk about what's changing in the world, the future, and how we can help with that. Every month I'll talk about a different future theme. For example, the future of science, tech, sustainability, reading, music and all sorts of other ones. The future of everything. Did you know? You can find me on Facebook and Instagram as Jade to the Future and on YouTube as Jack to the Future. Follow me to get behind the scenes info, access to the previews about my next episodes and much, much more. You may have heard my episode earlier on in my STEM to the Future series about the future of energy where I spoke about where electricity comes from. Well, today I'm talking about the future of energy again, but this time about renewable energy and reducing the amount of carbon being released into the air by using an alternative to fossil fuels. I start with a little reminder about the main types of fossil fuels, coal, oil and gas and one of my engineer guests gives us a brief introduction about where oil comes from and how it is extracted and refined. Don't worry, I'll explain what those words mean later. And then I interviewed another engineer who used to work for a company that used wood pellets as biomass as an alternative to power, a power station that used to run on coal. A really interesting episode lined up for you. First up, a reminder about why we want to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in our Earth's atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas and it's one of the reasons for climate change. The Earth needs some carbon dioxide, but when there's too much it acts like an extra thick blanket. It traps more of the sun's heat and makes the planet get too hot. This is what's happening right now. Across the world, the largest human source of carbon dioxide emissions is from the burning of fossil fuels. We depend on oil for much more than you might even realise. From the transport of production of food, clothing, materials, medicines and the plastic used to make a whole load of products. Have you ever wondered where we actually get gas and oil from? So they basically come from dead sea animals and plants that existed millions of years ago. These got trapped under multiple layers of sand and mud as they got buried deeper and deeper. The heat and the pressure increases. Depending on the amount of pressure, heat and the type of organisms, this will determine whether the organisms will become natural gases or oil. The more the heat, the lighter the oil. If there is even more heat and the organisms were made up of mostly plants, then natural gas is formed. Well, that's cool. I did not know that. Here's Graham Evans to explain it all. He is an oil and gas production systems controls engineer and used to design tools to measure things for machines, like changes in temperatures and pressure. Hi, my name is Graham Evans. Jack has asked me a little intro on how is gas oil extracted and refined. Conventional natural gas and oil deposits are found in permeable rocks, trapped below impermeable rock. So once the oil and natural gas is formed, it goes through pores which are like little gaps between the grains in the rocks until it gets trapped under rocks that don't have gaps that it can get through. These deposits can be extracted by drilling down through the impermeable rock into the permeable rock. So to get to the fuel, they have to drill through the sediment and rock. On land, oil can be drilled with an apparatus called an oil rig or drilling rig, sometimes known as a nodding donkey. Offshore oil is drilled from an oil platform. Most modern wells use an air rotary drilling rig which can operate 24 hours a day. You can't just take the oil out of the ground and use it. It could be toxic if you did that. The refining process is the method by which crude oil is altered into usable consumable products such as gasoline, petrol, diesel and other petroleum products. When crude oil is refined, it is heated until it becomes a gas. The liquids and vapours separate into petroleum components called factions. With a distillation column, each part evaporates and then condenses in its own compartment. Imagine if you had a mixture of milk and water. If we heated the mixture, some parts would start to evaporate quicker than the others at a particular heat. Water first, then the milk. I hope that's some information for you. I'm sure there's some words in there you want to look at, find out exactly what they mean. But it's in the simple layman terms, it's very difficult to do it unless I use these words that are common to the industry. Well, I hope you enjoy Jack's podcast and uh, good luck. So there you have it, a little lesson on gas and oil. Thanks, Graham. There's one major problem, though, apart from the carbon dioxide issue, obviously. These fuels are non-renewable, 
So basically, once it's gone, it's gone, and they could not be easily replaced. So what could be an alternative to burning oil or gas or any fossil fuels to generate power? Introducing biomass. Biomass is basically organic matter, basically anything that comes from the ground. For example, wood, plants, that kind of thing. Biomass can be used and burned to make energy. In a few minutes, I'll be talking to an engineer who used to work for the company Drax. Drax's power station uses wood pellets as their source of biomass. I'd like to introduce my special guest today, Aruza Adizi, who has worked for lots of different companies who specialise in energy and power. She is also a STEM ambassador for the IET. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for having me, Jack. <laughs> You're very welcome. Mum told me that you recently got a new job. Congratulations. Most of my questions about your old job, and maybe if we have time, we could talk about the new job at the end too. Yep, that works for me. Okay. My first episode in this series was all about the different types of engineers that there are. What sort of engineer are you? I've really worked in energy and power for my whole career. So after leaving university... My first job was where I worked in oil and gas, actually. So I used to work on oil and gas platforms offshore, installing pumps where we were kind of sucking up the oil from the ground. So I did that for a couple of years. And then I worked for National Grid. Do you know anything about National Grid, Jack? I don't know what it is, no. So National Grid operate and maintain the electricity transmission network in the UK. So when you're driving along and you see those big pylons, they're the ones who build those pylons and they're the ones who make sure that those pylons are working as you want them to. And also they build substations. I'm not sure if you know what pylon, what they do. So they're there to transmit power all over the country. So that's how you get power from a power station to your home. They travel through the wires in these pylons. So my job there was supervising projects where we built those pylons, which is really cool <laughs> because I, I don't know if you've ever seen a pylon up close. It's uh... <laughs> um, I was driving along and I did actually see one. It was very close to us and it is huge with all its wires like one there one there one there and one there and then there's like a thing that joins all them together mm-hmm. with like four holes i don't know what that is they're insulators that separate the wires from the actual pylon structure itself and then also they have these i think they're called spaces which actually separate the different wires from each other so they don't touch so it's all there to make sure that the whole structure and everything is safe yeah really. okay And it's really cool because when I was at National Grid, I got to see how they actually put those pylons together. And it's actually like, I don't know if you have Meccano. It's like one of those sets, they build it on the ground and then they have this huge crane that come and lifts each part and puts it all together. So that was... Yeah, I I think my grandmas have it. When you see them, they're like bolting things together like you would... For mechanos. Yeah. And then after National Grid, I worked as an innovation engineer for a company called Drax. So with that job, I was working on different projects in like renewable energy. I really enjoyed the job because I got to do a lot of research into what different technologies out there in renewable energy. Yeah, it sounds really cool. I really like to work there as an innovation engineer. So yeah. oh, that'd be really good. <laughs> you used to work for a company that reduces the amount of fossil fuels that are used to generate power. What did they use instead? My company, they used to use coal to produce power, and then they converted four of their sick coal units to using biomass, which is, which is actually better because it produces less CO2 when you burn it. And also, as you know, CO2 is one of the greenhouse gases that causes global warming. So they did a lot of work to increase the amount of biomass that they were burning until now all four units are burning biomass. They've still got two units that are burning coal, um, but they're, they're shutting them down this year. So if you look around, a lot of power stations are stopping using coal. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they've all like tried to make them more like, you know, better for the environment. So they've changed it to biomass. Is it like wood pellets? 
Yeah, so um, they are wood pellets. They're little, but there's different types of biomass. Biomass is really any organic substance that's like not coal. Yeah, wood yeah. pellets. Are well, isn't using wood from trees a bad thing because animals will lose their homes? The company use waste wood and residues from sustainably managed forests. So you have people who that's their job to make sure that the wood that's being used is coming from places that won't disturb the ecosystem, won't prevent any animals from having homes. They make sure that everything is like as it should be. So if they're using wood from one area, they'll make sure they'll create another area where if any uh, animals need to be, they'll put them there. Okay. So that's. If it removes CO2 from the air, and then plants wouldn't be able to grow because they absorb CO2 to survive. So how would they get trees that they need to cut down if they're taking all the CO2 from the air, which means the trees can't grow? Well, they don't use a whole tree. They use wood that's on the floor, for example, or thinnings, for example. And then they replant the trees as well. They'll cut down some bits of the tree and then they replant it. All in all, it should balance out, really. Oh, OK. Yeah, that makes sense. I was a bit confused about it. So that answers it. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's that's what they should do. Yeah. <laughs> If, if they do, if any company uses biomass, they should make sure that they speak to people to make sure that they are operating everything properly. And when they're taking wood, they're really replacing it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What happens to the smoke when you burn the wood pellets? Doesn't that release carbon dioxide? Yeah, it does. So when you burn any biomass or any fossil fuel, it does release carbon dioxide. And it's really important that we find ways to prevent that carbon dioxide from getting out into the atmosphere. So one thing that Drax was doing is that they had this big project looking at carbon capture. So carbon capture is basically, instead of letting the carbon dioxide be released, you're kind of sucking it up and then they want to bury it and use pipes to transfer it from the power station into maybe a well or into the North Sea or something like that. Carbon capture is going to be really important in the future. So a lot of companies are looking and making sure that they can um, get this working. There have been a couple of projects looking at carbon capture, but they've only been able to capture carbon at a smaller scale. At Drax, for example, they've captured like one ton a day from the carbon capture plants that we have that we're trialing at the power station. But they were hoping to capture up to 8 million tons of carbon dioxide a year by 2030. So it's a big, big project and everyone's working towards that. That sounds really, really cool. We saw a video on Drax's website of them putting it back under the sea. We also saw how they drill oil as another engineer talked about that early in my podcast. It looked really similar, but I know it's kind of the opposite. It's all the same. So basically when they drill the well and they're producing, getting all the oil from the ground and all the gas from the ground, at some point, all of those wells will be empty. So those are the wells that they're looking at putting CO2 in. So it's kind of reusing old wells and they try and you reuse old equipment. Oh, yeah, yeah, because in the video they drilled out a hole and where they run out of oil or whatever from that hole, they drill another one and put this plug thing in the old hole. So you're basically saying they'd pump the carbon back through the hole into the ground. Yeah. We saw the Bex, was it called Bex? Machine thing on Drax's website. It was like a big tower and it was and it was better at taking the carbon out of the fumes that released when the biomass pellets were burned and the non-harmful gases could then still go into the air. That was quite helpful to me actually because sometimes when we're driving past a factory I like see gas coming out of the chimney and I've always wondered Will we stop seeing the smoke coming out eventually? <laughs> well, I'm not sure if you'll stop but the gases that are being released they'll be non-harmful and then actually I didn't know this before but some of what you see being released through the chimney it's it's those gases but then through the towers through those big water towers it's actually water vapor so it's not actually toxic gas some of it but it should be less toxic in the future yeah yeah the wood pellets are a lot smaller than I thought they look like rabbit food how many would you need to power a whole factory at Drax they using about just over 7 million tonnes of those wood pellets a year. So every day at Drax, around 20,000 tonnes of wood pellets arrives. That's a huge amount. 
and they come all the way from sustainably managed forests in North America and Canada. It's really cool how they actually make those pellets. So they'll take this waste wood and they'll grind it up and dry it. And then they'll press it through a mold, which makes into those pellet shapes. And they do that. They make wood pellets because when you're transporting them from America, for example, it comes by ship. And that's the best way to transport it because it doesn't let as much moisture in and it's just better for the wood pellets to do that. Yeah, <laughs> they're really cool. <laughs> I don't have a rabbit, so I'm not sure what rabbit food looks like. <laughs> I was wondering why they weren't bigger, actually. Because they could be like logs of wood, sort of like that big. You know, really, that would work. Yeah. That's like a good point. So basically, remember I told you that the power station used to run on coal yeah. for running on biomass? So when they were doing that, they decided they did a lot of experiments and they saw that the best way to convert from coal to biomass was actually to use these wood pellets, because that meant they, they could have reused some of the equipment that they had when they were burning coal. So it just works out cheaper using wood pellets. And it's just makes more sense when you're transporting it in boats, if you use pellets as well. And you really want the wood to be dry. <laughs> so that's why they use wood pellets, because it's drier. If they use big lumps of wood, it's just more complicated because the big chunks of wood is like really wet. It's like got a really high moisture content. So it makes much more sense for them to use pellets. Yeah, that makes sense. So, because if it was wet, it would make it, well... It'll cause problems for the yeah. um, the equipment if it's really wet. Yeah. It probably, when it, like, burns it. Well, this is just one point, that it would probably make it harder for it to burn if it was wet and moisturised. Yeah. That's a really good point. And remember this... The, the equipment at the power station, for example, has been existing for decades. So the equipment is quite old, some of it. So you have to make sure that you treat it really well. So you wouldn't want to put like really wet wood into it because that would, I don't know, cause issues. And then everything would have to ship down and that's really expensive. So you want it to be as dry as possible. And those wood pellets, they're all the same. So you have really consistent fuel. Whilst if you use a wet fuel, it could be different. That makes sense. I like your title at Drax, Innovation Engineer. It's like an inventor. What sort of things did you do? No day is the same. So basically, I had a couple of projects that I was working on looking at different fuels that we could use, for example, waste. Also, I talked to people in different companies about the waste, like what kind of waste there is, what we can do with it if we burn it. I need to find out what happens. Can we burn it in the power station? What happens to the equipment? So I talked to various people inside the company and outside the company, and we'd all work together to try and come up with a solution. I had to always think about how much everything costs. So we want to make sure that in the future we have renewable energy but that's not too expensive. Yeah, that's really good that you get to talk to multiple people about what you're interested in and what you want to work on with the factories <laughs> yeah and how to do a lot of reading and research which yeah. I quite enjoyed and it was really fun when you read about a new technology and you think I never knew this existed and then you reach out and you try to talk to people about what they're doing and you, you just get so much knowledge and it's really exciting yeah should be yeah I think I really love that too why is it important that we reduce our carbon emissions? Do you think that we'll get to net zero by 2030? Carbon dioxide is one of the greenhouse gases that causes global warming. So we really want to minimise or reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that we, we use um, in industry and in our lives, basically. Because when we have global warming, it causes things like really extreme weather conditions. So it gets really hot in places and really, really cold in places. I don't know if if you read recently, I think it was in India, it got so hot. I think that it was nearly 50 degrees at those temperatures. It's really hard for people to even, I don't know, survive really. And if it's that hot, we're melting the ice caps and it's causing people, plants and animals to not be comfortable. It's destroying habitat. So it's really important that we, we really reduce all these greenhouse gases. Yeah, it is really important that we do that so it doesn't well, destroy our earth because 
by 2060. There was a video that we watched a few months ago, I think it was, where it said by 2060, if we don't do anything to like help the environment by then, that and it was like all dried up land certification. Mm. So I think it's really important that we do it now and we don't wait till later. I think yeah, that's so true. Yeah, we need to do as much as we can right now, you know, start investing and start working on these new technologies so that they'll be ready as soon as possible. So we have to have everyone involved. We need the government to make sure that they are passing the right laws. We need to make sure everyone in industry is working towards and all companies are working towards it. And then also, I think it's really important that we ourselves need to make sure that we're doing the right thing. So seeing what we can do to reduce our own carbon footprint, if we can recycle or reduce as much as possible, reuse waste, reuse different materials. Also, we need to think about what we eat, if we can eat more more vegetables and less meat, for example. And then also, unfortunately, think about how we travel. Do we need to buy an electric car? Do we really need to take long distance flights? which I'm not a fan of because I really like to travel. So that's going to be difficult for me. But I think that we can get to net zero by 2030 if we all work together and if we all really think about what we're doing. So, yeah, that would be really good to do that. Do you think we can get to net zero? Definitely. I know it's a saying that says, if you put your mind to do it, you can accomplish anything. So, Oh, wow. (laughs) What I love is that these days, the younger generation, everyone's just thinking they understand the importance of this and telling the government to do things and they have more knowledge than the older generation. So I think it can happen. (laughs) Yeah. On the website for the company you used to work for, we saw that Drax had two hydropower stations in Scotland. We've got a lot of rivers and seas in the UK. So why aren't we using this form of power more? Um, that's a good question. It can be done, but also it's quite expensive to build hydro plants, but you want it to be as big as possible because then it makes more sense money wise. But then if you make it really big, then there's not many locations that you can really build these. At Drax, we have one in Scotland called Kraken, and that was built in an old I don't know, mountain. (laughs) I don't think you can do that these days because there are a lot of laws and things like that preventing it. So a lot of hydro plants, it's really dependent on where you want to build it and the cost as well. And then also you have to think about the ecosystem and the animals in those different areas. So sometimes it just, it's not practical to do that. It's a really good power source. It's a really good way to store energy as well. In the future, maybe instead of using pumped hydro, we might just install loads of batteries <laughs> in different places. Yeah, that'd be good. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So what's your new job and what are you most excited about? My new job is I'm going to be working as Net Zero Manager for a company called Tarmac. So Tarmac produces building materials and it's quite important for our Net Zero future because cement which you use to make buildings, obviously, and roads. They produce around 8% of the global CO2. So we really want to find a way to reduce the CO2 that's produced, a carbon dioxide that's produced when um, you make cement. And in the future, we're going to want to build more and more houses for people to live in. So it's really important to think about what you can do there. So I think it's going to be a huge task. But I'm really excited yeah. <laughs> about that. Try and make it zero, zero percent. Yeah, if everything yeah. adds up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If there's any way that we can use that CO2 in other ways, like carbon capture as well, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Could they just not make cement from different materials? Would that solve the problem? Yeah, that's a really good point because there's a lot of testing when they make cement. They need to make sure that it's the right strength because obviously you're building a house and you don't want the house to collapse. So people are quite hesitant to make any changes to the cement because it could cause damage and it could be quite dangerous. Yeah. It's a process that we have to get through and make people comfortable. (laughs) Yeah. 
Thank you for being here today, Arisa, and talking to me about your job and your new job. My favourite part was when we talked about carbon emissions that will get to net zero by 2030. Thanks a lot, Jack. This has been fun. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That's all we've got time for today. Well, that was a really interesting episode. And yet again, my head is exploding with knowledge. Mum will put the link to his director's website in the podcast description. Thanks to my guests for today for taking part. It's a good idea for sure, but I think like with all these new technologies, there is things that need to be tweaked to make them even better in the future. Like the size and weight of all the pellet, and where they could be stored, the price, how they're transported from far away. Making sure that everybody is making sure that animals and forests are being looked after, so that it doesn't impact badly on the environment. It's amazing to think what the future of energy might be. And as I said before in a previous episode, I think the answer is probably going to be a combination of solutions rather than just one alone. Join me next time for another exciting episode of Jack of the Future.